Thank you, Michael. Michael is doing two jobs again up there, two chairs, two, wearing two hats, going from one chair to the other. He did tell me, though, I'm so used to preaching that don't be surprised if I get up and jump in in front of you and start preaching. <laughs> but it looks like I've made it here, and it's really good to be here. I'm just so glad to be in front of my own church. I never preach anywhere else, just here. And it's, it's great to be able to meet with you together as we study. Uh, <clears throat> the, the, term of my, the, the topic of my sermon today is called What Manner of Persons Ought You to Be? And we're going to be looking at Second Peter, the third chapter. And we will go to Matthew 2 also at some time. But before, let's have a word of prayer before we just start. Dear Lord, we invite your presence to be here today. Dear Father, what a wonderful saviour you are. And we all sang there, when the, world, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. And it was really, it's a personal thing. And each and every one of us want to be there when you come. Pray that you'll be with us as we read part of your precious word today. For we ask these things in your name. Amen. Second Peter, the third chapter. And these verses start at verse 8. From verse 8 down to verse 14. And there's so much in these verses. There's so much that show us. First of all, in verse 8, let's read what it says. It says, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. What does that tell us about the God, our God? It tells us, doesn't it, that he is endless and a day to him is nothing. Time goes on. But beloved, do not forget that one thing. Then in verse 9 it says, Lord, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness. Well, we don't think that the Lord is slack in anything, do we not? We know that he's far from slack in anything. He's not slack, it says. But what is he? It is long-suffering towards us. He's not slack. Not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So this part of these verses are telling us one thing about our God that he has a lot of time. He knows what he's going to do and he knows the exact time when he's going to do it. He's not slack, delaying his coming. He's doing it because he wants to give everyone their chance. He wouldn't have it that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Verse 10 says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will all be burnt up. So this gives us some information about what is going to happen in the future. What is going to happen? The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night as a thief in the night what does a thief do when he comes he waits doesn't he he doesn't come when you expect him he doesn't come when things are okay no he comes at a time when he's going to take you off guard Jesus doesn't want to come and take you off guard he just tells you he will not tell you he will come and we must be looking forward to that. And also in that verse, it tells us that one day everything is going to be burnt up. Everything is going to be <coughs> burnt up. The elements will melt with fervent heat, both on the earth. The works that are, <coughs> are in it will be burnt up. So it tells us there that really the things of this world, the things that we have, our houses, our cars... And let me, don't get, get me wrong, it's great to have a nice house to live in. It's great to have a nice car to drive around. These things can be blessings to us that God gives us. 
It's great to have things that we spend a bit of time with. But one day we've got to realise that these things are going to be burnt up, that they're got, not going to be around anymore, that we're, going to, we're not going to have them and things are going to happen. They're going to be burnt up. So verse 11 asks us a question then as we look on. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? It asks the question. First of all, he says, I've delayed my coming. I want that everyone should have the chance. I want that everyone should come to repentance. I, wouldn't, I don't like to think that anyone will not. Of course, we know that's just not going to happen because God has given us a will. And some people will use that will. Some of them won't. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? And then in verse 12, it says, looking for the hastening of the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Again, telling us what is going to happen there. But 13 says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth, do we not? We get a bit sick of this old world the way it is. Sure, there's things in it, but all these things are going to be destro destroyed. But we should be looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth that God has prepared for us. He has prepared a wonderful eye has not seen nor ear heard the things that he will do and has prepared for us. That should be on the forefront of our minds. And the new heavens and the new earth which righteousness dwells, it says there. Therefore, 14 says, Beloved, Looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. You know, just for a little while, just for a second, we're going to pop over to Matthew. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Matthew, the 25th chapter. And that's a parable, and of course it's a well-known parable. And it's a really, it describes, the first verse says, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Well, we were reading in, in Second Peter that the bridegroom has delayed his coming. He's, he, he's delayed it because he wants that no one should perish. But this talks about it. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. And of the ten, they were split down the middle. You know, they, they had their lamps. They had their lamps, did they not? The ten of them had their lamps. They were expecting the bridegroom to come. They were looking to see him come. But five of them were foolish. Maybe they didn't have their heart completely in looking for the bridegroom to come. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. So in other words, they took their lamps. I take it they had oil in them, but they didn't take any spare oil. They didn't have any spare oil in their lamp. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at the midnight cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out and meet him. This is something that we're all looking for. We all know the bridegroom is coming. We all know that soon he will come. We all know soon too that when he comes well we would better have made our decision right by then because when it says back in second peter about a thief coming in the night what is that talking about 
And the midnight cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out and meet him. Then all the virgins rose up and trimmed their lamps. Yes, they were waiting. They were wanting to see him. Yes, they had their lamps trimmed. They were expecting their Lord to come and they were looking for him. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. Give us some of that oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise answer saying, no, lest there should be not enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. What a disappointment. And so, I guess, in still in preparation for him to come, the foolish ones had to, not being prepared quite yet, had to go out and buy more oil somewhere else. They had to go out and get more oil but the wise yes but while they went to buy the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding and the door was shut afterward the other virgins came finally they came to their senses finally they got the oil that they needed and they said Lord Lord open to us They banged on the door. But he answered and said, Surely I say unto you, I do not know you. What a terrible thing to hear when you're expecting someone, when you're expecting the bridegroom, when you are looking for him, when you have your lamps, but you haven't really prepared properly for the Lord to come. Watch therefore, it says in verse 13, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man cometh. Now going back, going back there to Second Peter and looking at some of the verses there, like I said, just to revise it again, the bridegroom is coming. The Lord... Well, he's a thousand days is a, is a day or a day is a thousand days. He will come when he's ready. He will come when the time is right. But beloved, do not forget one thing. Yes, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. Yes, so we know he's not slack. He wants it all we should be ready. He's giving us time that we should all be ready. What sort of people should we be knowing all this in our heart? Knowing this, should we have our lights trimmed? When it talks about having the oil, the preparation, the wise ones, they had their oil. They were preparing for the coming of the Lord. They were watching for him. And they knew that they'd have their lights burning until he came. The foolish, well, they didn't have the oil. Maybe they didn't. What does this oil mean? What is the oil that we should have? How can we prepare this oil? How can we be out not attending to having oil in our lamp? What is this this oil? Is it not the communication with God the Father, with God the Son, with Jesus? Isn't that the oil that we need in our lamps? That communication with him that he may come to us, that we may come to him that we may surrender to him every day. This is the oil we need to keep our lamps burning until the day that Jesus comes. You know, before the flood, Jesus, God, was looking down. Let's look, just quickly go over to Genesis. He was looking down on the people before the flood in the Andalusian days. He looked upon them. And just see what it says there in verse 6, chapter 6 and verse 5. He looked down on the world of that time and he saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his man's heart was evil continually. So He had come to the end of his tether with man in those days. 
He even said in verse 6, the Lord was so sorry that he, he was sorry that he'd made man on the earth and he was grieved to his heart. He'd given them chance after chance. Sure, there were people in those days. And so he rose up a man of Noah and we know the story. And Noah was a man of God. And Noah built an ark. We know the story. I need not tell you the story. And the ark was there, but for 220 years, the preaching went forward to the people of that time. They were giants of stature, giants of intellect. Some of them came to them, to, 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 to the story. Some of them looked around them and said, there's no doubting this world is as, as wicked as, as Noah says it is. No doubt about it. And they, they started believing. But then they started falling in, I guess, with the, the, the tenor of the day. It had never, ever rained. People were making jibes about Noah. What are you building a boat for? How can there ever be water to float it? And then I guess they turned back. And in the end, it turned out they may have been people who were accusing Noah more than any of the others, laughing at him even more. But finally the day came when even though they saw the animals going into the ark, even though they saw the animals going into the ark by themselves, two by two, five by five, still that didn't strike them that this was going to happen. And when Noah and his family were in the, in, the, in the ark for days before anything happened, yes, they started to scoff at him. Scoff at him. What are you doing in there? But then we know the result. In the end, they were banging on the ark. You see, they got sick of seeing the old boat on the hill. And they threw it in. The Lord was just delaying his covering, coming. It says in Second Peter 3, verse 2. It says in Second Peter verse, verse 2, it says, or in verse 3, knowing, the first, knowing first that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. All things so in our time, it says, people are going to scoff about that. People are maybe going to think, oh, the Lord's coming. Or I had a friend that went out of the message because he said that he knew the Bible. And he said that he knew that one day, one day, you know, he knew the Bible and he knew the signs that were going to happen in the world. He used to go on Saturday and, and ride his surfboard and he used to do those things because he said, I know, I can see when times are coming, when I see the things that are going to happen, well, I'll just turn around and come back. Brothers and sisters, there have seen many signs in the world and I've never seen him come back. He hasn't come back yet. What sort of people should we be what sort of people should we be in those days? The question is asked. The question is asked. You know, Jesus is knocking on our heart's door every day. He, he's knocking on our heart's door every single day, wanting us to, to open the door and let him in. And he doesn't. He doesn't care if you don't open the door that day because he's knocking the next day and the next and the next. Be ready for me. I'm giving you time, but not for forever. One day, and that's what the thief in the night is about, because probation can place for us tomorrow, can it not? The next day, whatever, we never know what is going to happen in this world. Probation can close when Jesus walks out of the, of the holy place in heaven and says, it is finished. Then those that are sinful will remain sinful and those who are righteous 
will remain righteous. This is the thief in the night that has comes upon us. What sort of person should we be? What sort of person? What should we be doing? You know, Paul says in Romans 7, 24, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And when we look at ourselves, we are wretched. We're sinful. We can only be saved by the Lord Jesus. It's not a big thing. We are so wretched that God loves us or will love us just by loving Jesus, just by coming to him because we don't do the work. He changes us. He does the work. He turns us from wretched people into righteous people. And he does it. We can't do it of ourselves. Only through that oil where we communicate with him every day. It takes an everyday experience. Wretched man. When I think of wretchedness, I can't help but think of the thief on the cross. He was a man who... He was always, from the very start in his life, I guess, was always in the wrong place at the right time. He probably didn't go to school too much or if he did he probably wagged it half the time he probably spent a lot of his time instead of being at school going out and robbing and thieving and doing little things like that and as his life went on and on he got worse and worse until here he was here he was on the cross dying the cross of, of the death of crucifixion he'd come to the climax of his life and all he had was what he'd been doing but yet how lucky was this man that beside him on the cross was Jesus the wonderful God and creator of the world he was beside him on the cross the other thief was shouting and roaring and saying to Jesus, if you're God, save yourself and us too. But not him. He saw something different in Jesus. He came to him and he said, Father, remember me? You come to my kingdom? Yeah. And he heard those words. Yes, today, I say to you today that you will be with me in paradise only the great God of the universe could have said those words to him at long last this man was in the right place at the right time how many people are there out there in the world that are wretched just like you and me we can't look at anybody we can't say, I'm better than you. Because we're not. We're no better. We're no better than anybody else. We just need Jesus in our heart. And we need to tell people, there are many wretched souls out living in Penrith. Wretched souls we come across every day that we can say a word in due season, that we can do these things. What sort of person or manner of person should we be? Yes. When Jesus comes into our heart, we will do that. We will do it. We won't, we won't want to do anything else. We want to tell people about Jesus. Because a soul is so precious in the sight of God. It was battered and scarred and the auctioneer thought it hardly worth his while to spend much time on the old violin. And he held it up with a smile. What am I offered, good folks? He cried. Who'll start the bidding for me? A dollar? A dollar? Who'll make it two? Two dollars? Who'll make it three? Three dollars once. Three dollars twice. And going. And, but no. An old grey-haired man came forward from the back of the room. And picking up the old violin and dusting off the 
the dust and tightening up the loose strings, he played a melody as sweet and pure as the heavenly angels sing. The music was in their ears. The music stopped. And the auctioneer, with a voice that was low, said, What am I offered for the old violin? And he held it up with a bow. A thousand dollars! Who'll make it two? Two thousand! Who'll make it three? Three thousand once! Three thousand twice! And going! And gone! Said he. Some people cheered. And some of them cried, We don't understand. What changed its worth? Swift came in the reply, the touch of the master's hand. And many a man with life out of tune, his battered and scarred with sin out there, his auction cheek to the thoughtless crowd, a much like the old violin. A mass of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He's going once. She's going twice. They're going and almost gone. And then the master comes. The master comes. And the foolish crowd, they just don't quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that's wrought by the touch of the master's hand. That's what he is to us. When he comes to us, it's the touch of his hand on us. And when we witness to somebody else, it's the touch of his hand on them. It's all about Jesus. It's all about the master. Mm. You know, we need to keep our lamps burning. We need to turn on our lamps. We need to have plenty of oil ready that's just communication with the Lord knowing that the bridegroom delays his coming be watchful and ready to keep our lamps burning for the one who would have us not be ready laughs at our slackness laughs at our efforts rejoices in our failures but trembles when we pray. Always remember that. That communication with God foils him. He hates it. Jesus is willing and eager to communicate with us, to help us through the trials that will and do come to us, to guide us and, if necessary, carry us part of the way. For God would not have it that anyone should perish, but all should come to repentance. I pray that each and every one here today, each person here, has it in their heart to, to stay, keep their oil and their lights burning in him. For that's my prayer this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.